Hello, my name is Elijah Wells, and today's review is Martin Scorsese's new movie, Killers of the Flower Moon. Set in the 1920s Oklahoma, when oil is discovered in native uh, territory, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's character, who is Ernest uh, Burkhardt, is taken under the wing of w William King Hale, who is betrayed by Robert De Niro. As, uh, knowing that, 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 that the natives have been extremely, extremely wealthy with their oil, uh, so uh, William uh, uh, enlists uh, Ernest and takes him under the wing to essentially uh, kill off uh, one of the richest members of the native families that own a lot of oil in the area, killing him off one by one, even putting himself and his uh, family in, into complete dangerous territory. The movie got a major amount of notoriety, not just being Martin Scorsese's first film to be released in cinemas uh, since his 2016 movie, Silence, and also coming off with the whirlwind, the whirlwind success that has The Irishman, which is a brilliant movie by the way, but also this is his first movie that starred both of his frequent collaborators, being Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro, who uh, had their respective eras working with uh, a Martin Scorsese, and it was by time at this point that they're both uh, both these acting t items would be showing that the same film uh, be being directed by the person who would uh, infrequently employ them in their own movies, which again already ramps up the anticipation uh, quite a in this, a bit in this movie. And also, the movie was also majorly talked about due to its distributor uh, being Apple Original Films or Apple TV Plus, but they're now known as Apple Original Films, who are giving uh, a major, massive budgeted films a massive shot in the big screen, which is something that uh, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, and Netflix has been uh, either doing, either not doing at all, or doing at a really watered down rate in this uh, grand sense of things. And it also, uh, throwing their hat in the ring again only uh, next month time with the Ridley Scott epic, Napoleon. So it was a very pleasing sight to see as someone who really treasures the big screen uh, experience, the shared experience of watching a film with strangers you are probably uh, will never meet again, which is something uh, Apple has definitely prided itself with, uh, particularly when I've seen a couple of their more uh, uh, films they released back in 2020 with Wolf Walkers and On the Rocks, which is something I do majorly appreciate as well. The movie also has a majorly captivating performance and a phenomenal uh, uh, work that is Lily Gold, uh, Gladstone, who at this point was only known for uh, indie movies like First Cow, for one of the examples that I just presented. And even though this is her first like uh, uh, foyer into like major blockbuster uh, territory, like one or like. Uh, something made by a major film director and all that. Uh, she was absolutely brilliant in this movie. I do say, I do want to credit, of course, Robert De Niro, who was brilliant in the movie, and as well as Leonardo DiCaprio, who were also brilliant, uh, just completely knocked it out of the park. And also uh, Jesse Plums, who only appears in the second half of the movie, but uh, the one person that definitely stole the show is Lee Gold, uh, Gladstone, who was just absolutely phenomenal in her work. Yeah, I just absolutely, I uh, just hope that there's going to be more roles just rolling in her way, uh, pretty much in the wake of this uh, absolutely uh, grandiose performance that comes on her. The cinematography in this movie by Rodrigo Prieto, who also uh, well, is massive, had a massive uh, uh, thing this year, being the Barbie movie, as he also shot the movie as well, as well as Killers of a Flower Moon. Particularly uh, how he uh, one scene where the whole crop field just got burnt up and just how gorgeously lit it, the movie was with the silhouettes, the glowing uh, flames uh, that are very pungent with the orange and pungent and very potent with the reds, which is almost like you walked into like a scene from hell, which is something that's very eerie and something that really brings out the atmosphere of the movie as well, even though. Uh, there's quite a lot of wide shots in this movie, which is something that I've, I definitely now noticed that Martin Scorsese did emphasise a lot more in this movie than his uh, previous movies, but again, this is something that uh, he, re he really did have a key eye on how the movie would look, as it's also, if I'm correct if I'm wrong, I think this is his first movie that he shot on IMAX, which is something that I uh, really, really uh, do like. Just just on a sort of purpose, I do 
uh, like how directors, regardless of their inexperienced or like an established na name like Marcel Scorsese, like how they would like uh, use IMAX to their full advantage, which is something that I'm very generally pleased about, uh, particularly with how it turned out in this movie. Even though the world building isn't as like um, massive or like has a like full blown scope to it, like his like most of his previous works, like. Well, in my opinion, this is like uh, how he uh, uses uh, the one small town in Oklahoma to pretty much uh, explain the politics and the frustration and the economics that were, that were going on in, essentially in 1920s America as, again, the murders were going on in the background and how the natives were getting, essentially, uh, uh, having, a car having the carpet like thrown underneath them, like uh, rolled away. And it was also a very, very interesting, uh, as it does explore not just uh, the mansion and many other places like businesses, but owned by both whites and natives, but also like jail scenes and of course uh, the FBI Bureau, uh, which is some, uh, particularly where they're headquartered, which is something that is like a really captivating in my opinion as a uh, do uh, uh, do away from more generic tropes and just uh, kind of look at the more what is say more of a seedy underbelly of the, how the western world how basically the wild west was uh, back in the 1920s and also the movie does touch on the grim outlook of being a Native American in the 1920s not just the murder rate was of course uh, unfortunately pretty high around that point but also the uh, the life expectancy was essentially just around in the 50s, which is like extremely low, but I'm not sure how much that may have improved in, the, in this contemporary age, but also uh, how people essentially were ostracizing them like one by one and how they were almost like mistreated to the point it, it, it was essentially just a form of bigoted uh, system that was uh, headed towards their way in a sense. and. It was also, again, like I said earlier, it does explore a lot about the politics around this area and uh, particularly how the natives were almost like sidelined in that era, uh, era even though they were uh, back then the, the most ri the richest and the most powerful people around that era before they had a cup of like, uh, f uh, like tossed underneath them. Uh, which is something that is uh, does give the movie more of a dark and more of a, a dense feel uh, compared to a lot of other Scorsese films. And the one thing that has obviously been talked about in this movie a lot is it's pretty grueling runtime. Like, the movie does go on for 2 hours and 26 minutes. Even though in my cinema where I worked in and where I watched the movie, it did even feature a 15 minute long interlude. With the interlude which I basically used to just to go to the bathroom and just get more food. But again, even though his longest film is The Irishman, which goes on for, and also pretty brutal, but surprisingly pretty swift, three, eight, three and a half hours, and also there's films like Wolf of Wall Street and Gangs of New York, which also go on a similar runtime of like three hours. Even though the movie uh, isn't uh, the, the most, uh, isn't made for the most uh, impatient audience out there, I guess, like, the movie does uh, slowly and slowly build, it slowly gets to the point. And also, the movie, uh, the pacing-wise, even though it is, uh, can uh, drag on in certain scenes at the moment, uh, the overall payoff is that the movie, uh, only, even though it is 3 hours and 26 minutes long, it only feels like it's just uh, kissing 3 hours, or uh, just under 3 hours, like, at least I didn't, uh, at least it, I, I had some sort of mercy not to uh, completely drag out uh, more scenes than it is necessary. Although the movie is a definite daunting task for many people, particularly a three hour plus movie about the Osage murders and uh, basically how uh, uh, William King Hale essentially threw the, that entire demographic under the bus and how Ernest was almost essentially uh, uh, being uh, taken under his wing at this point. The, the movie does boast some excellent performances, particularly from Lily, from Lily Gladstone, who was the, pretty much the, uh, the uh, almost uh, the uh, key principal of this movie. Like, uh, almost the, uh, she was almost the complete highlight of this movie. Like, she basically is the standout performance in that movie. The movie also boasts some, uh, some extraordinary cinematography, the production designs of the movie and costume works is also really good. How it explored the politics in that era is also somewhat very divine as uh, very 
uh, interesting as well. Uh, and also, it, even though this movie is definitely not uh, for everyone, but I do employ uh, uh, everyone as much as possible to watch this movie, so I'm feeling a 9 out of 10. 9 out of 10. So, what do you think of The Killer of the Flower Moon? Let me know in the comments down below, like this video, subscribe, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and this is Elijah Wells, and bye.